So uh, yeah, let's get into it. We played another train game. We played this train game many times, but now that I've played it multiple times in a row, not at a convention with no time pressure, I have a lot more deep insight into it and a lot more thoughts about the 18xx genre as a whole. Right. There are still so many 18xx games we haven't played, and there is so much more for us to learn, which is why I keep playing them despite having many criticisms. Uh, but yeah, 18, there's 1846, which is the one we first played and did a show on. Yep. Uh, this is the second one I played, actually, which is 1889, which is uh, History Shikoku. of Shikoku Railways. So Shikoku is this island in Japan Shikoku. that I... Yeah, that I always remember because I was watching an anime uh, and there was a joke in the anime about an old lady who couldn't hear and someone and, and they asked the old lady asked someone where they were from and they said Shikoku um, or no, I think they she, someone said Jigoku, which is the Japanese Jigoku. word for hell. Right. And the old lady was like, oh, you're from Shikoku because <laughs> <Right? laughs> they sound Shikoku is a, a Japanese, an island of Japan. That is, uh, it, Shikoku literally translates to uh, four districts. So it has four districts, right? Sort of north, south, east, and west. And it's sort of cut in half by these mountain range. You can just look at it on a map and you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll be like, oh, that place. I know that. I've seen it on maps of Japan before. Yeah, that's Shikoku. So this game is about, uh, Shikoku was mostly served transportation-wise by ferries. Um, and then in the 1800s, obviously, like, oh, around 1889 or so. <laughs> it began to be served it began to be served by trains uh, uh, that would take you between the places on Shikoku and this game is an evil game of capitalism uh, about that takes place on that geography in that time period all right so 18xx games we're not going to get into the whole story you can listen to our 1846 episode which was our introduction to the genre but they're train games they're like archetypical train games right. with a when you think team. about Right, when you think about, oh, those old guys at the game store playing train games, this is that game. This is what it is, right? The, the mystery has been revealed. It's not some mysterious place anymore. This is how the game is. And the fundamental thing about all these train games and the thing that draws me to them all, regardless of the, the details or problems, is the fundamental mechanic of the meta game being the real game, yep. right? You would look at this game or any of these games and say, aha, there's this map, there's these trains, you're trying to run trains to get the longest, to get long routes that are worth a lot of points. And that you would be thinking is that is the real game. But no, that game you're thinking of is Raro Tycoon, right? Raro Tycoon is the game yep. where you want to run the trains and get the most money. This game is this more is about extracting wealth from the system into your own personal coffers while fucking over other players with a spreadsheet. Right. So take Raro Tycoon and... No longer are you, is each player a train company. You are now instead a stock investor, wealthy person, right? A tycoon, and, a literal tycoon. Right, the players of the railroad tycoon are actually these abstract company objects and you buy and sell shares in them. You might at one point be the president of one, in which case you will decide what it does on its turn. You might be the president but, of two or three. Or, or, or all yeah. or none. Uh, and... You are, you know, so you might take the turn of a company once in a while here and there, but you are simply just trying to not make one company better or worse necessarily. You are simply trying to take the most money out of the system and into your pocket. Yep. Your right? money is not I, the company's money. You want to own shares in the valuable companies. You want to, when trains are required to be purchased, you want someone else to have to purchase them. <laughs> and then you want to get the revenues for when those trains run and passengers pay to get on them, right? Uh, when tracks have to be laid through the mountains, you want someone else to dig the tunnel and you want to run your train through it. Uh, or better yet, you want them to dig the tunnel and then put a blocking token so that they can't run their train yep. through it. Only you can. <laughs> this is the kind of game this is. Um, and they're all so like, what makes eight. Yeah, all these 18xx games are basically that same fundamental theme, but with crook. Like, rules are crooked slightly so. Like, in some games, the companies, if they, like, if someone buys enough stock to start one, they start with all the money that they could have started with from the bank. Right. In other games, so they what start makes with the money 18... the players put in. Right. So what makes 1889 different from the other ones, right? Well, I'm not going to go into all the details of everything that makes it different because I don't know them all. Yep. We're going to focus <laughs> more two... on, like, how it feels. Like, why? how does it feel different to play? 
Right. 1889 is mostly, from what I've heard, based a lot on 1830, which I think is the original 18xx game, with a few minor changes, and obviously the map is different and the trains are a little different, right? But the first big difference is that, you know, there's, a, there's this concept of a company floating, right? So it's, you know, every company starts with no one owning any shares, and you start buying shares, right? And And... You, when, you, when enough shares of a company have been bought, regardless of who bought them, the company comes into existence and can start playing the game. And the company has its own money, which is separate from players' money. So in 1846, which we did an episode on long ago... Which I'll link to. Uh, right. The way it works is that you buy IPO shares, and I forget how many you have to buy to make the company float, but it's some number. And then it, the company will have money equal to the money spent on those IPO shares, sort of like the real world, right? Like if I buy an IPO share for $100, the company now has $100 to in invest in it that it can use, right? Um, but then, you know, after the company floats, there are still IPO shares sitting there. And if you were to say buy one in 1846, that would put more money into the company, right? When you bought more shares. In 1889, let's say a company opens at $70, Right. Yep. So you're setting so the I initial share price at seventy dollars a share. Right. So and I buy five of the shares. So three hundred and fifty dollars is spent on buying shares. The other five shares are still there, available to be purchased at seventy dollars each. The IPO shares, the five that I did not buy, that someone else can buy later, or I can buy, or whatever. The company immediately, as soon as it floats, the company will immediately go open. And it will have $700 in its coffers, right? Buying those additional IPO shares will not put money into the company. The company starts with its full amount of money from all the shares, even though only five have been purchased. And when those remaining five are purchased, that money just goes to the bank, right? Yep. And what this means is that you can sort of get, you get this mechanic happening that doesn't happen in 1846 so much where you want to just float a company Suddenly, all that money you spent is doubled, but it's in a company. And you want to yank that money out of that company and into your wallet. Right? You can't just embezzle that, it directly. You can't just steal it. You, no, there's a fiction. you can't do that. Like, you need the company to buy a smaller company that you own personally from you at an exorbitant rate. Or you need to invest in a second company and then basically have that company, once you trick some other morons into investing into that company with you, you have your original company buy something from that company for like a dollar, like buy all that company's trains and then sell all that company's shares and fuck it. Yep. Uh, Things like don't... that happen. Exactly. And the main thing in this, the main rule in this game is that if a company has no trains, it must buy a train at the end of its turn, right? And if a company does not have enough money in its coffers to buy a train, the president of that company must contribute to buy the cheapest train available so from their wallet. And on top of that, different trains, like you can only buy trains in sequence, and there's like a level two, a level three, a level four train. Once you buy certain trains of certain levels, all the trains of certain earlier levels just instantly disappear and are gone forever and worth nothing. Right, so the game starts, only the two trains are available. The weakest train, they can only go to two spots, right? So they, they don't collect a lot yep. of money. They just go from point A to point B like a shuttle. Um and so let's say a company loads up on two trains. Well, as soon as I think a four train is bought, those two trains will all disappear from the game. Yep. Uh, so if a company is full of two trains and it doesn't have enough money, then as soon as someone else buys a four train, that company has no trains and has to buy one. So the, the trick you want to do would, would be be the owner of the company with the two trains. It suddenly doubles money. There's a big fountain of money in that company because yep. it just it floated. You want to use all the money from that company to buy trains from this other company that you started, your second company. So you moved all the money from company A that has the shit trains to company B, which has the good trains, yep. right? And then uh, company A loses all its trains, but luckily by the time that happens, you sold your shares in that shitty company and now someone else is the president and now they are forced to purchase a train with the money from their wallet and now you're ahead yep. because and your wallet is full of money that you didn't spend on trains you spent some 
company money on trains. And then you can use right? that money to buy more stocks and rinse and repeat. And everyone's trying right. to do and this now at that, the same right. time. How can that person now who just lost all the money in their wallet buying trains by, you know, out of pocket, uh, invest in stocks, right? <laughs> their, their funds are depleted. Yeah. A player can get the stock market out of this game. game pretty easily if they're not careful. And mm-hmm. The game is always tense. As soon as anyone has two companies, they could, there's a lot of ways they could screw everybody else over. Right. So I think the major, the major things going on in this game is that the turn order matters too much. That is right? probably like, what one thing, this review it's of true 18, of, I think, all the 18xx games, but it's especially true of this one. Yep. And that's sort of this interesting fatal flaw and why we want to talk about this game, because I enjoy 18xx games. I enjoy this one more than the other ones. Like, this is, I think, my favorite. Yeah, no, I enjoy it, but, but I still have problems with it. <laughs> yeah, but what we're realizing is that there are specific mechanics in these games that we like, but... There are other mechanics in these games that either obscure the reality of those mechanics or are kind of broken or arbitrary or limit how much you can engage with the fun parts of the game. So, so like you would think that like choosing the right stocks to buy, like figuring out their values into the future would be. The, the, like a, a really good heuristic that you would want in this game. It would be only if, help- if everyone playing the game had never played 1889 before. Sure, but that only helps you a little bit. That helps you like a tiny amount. Yep. When we were right? playing our it, game before, all four of us knew which stock was the hot stock at all times. No one disagreed about the value of anything at any point. Right. It's like, it was pretty much obvious. Like if you have money to buy a stock and you're going to buy one, which one to buy? There wasn't, it wasn't a hard decision um, and it didn't change the course of the game that significantly. What changes the course of the game significantly is like, well, I'm going third, therefore, blah. Yep. Right? Player order. That was much more important in now, this, terms this of is determining kind of, who was going to win. This is my real problem. Like the the deep flaw of all 18xx games is that the basic game, like operating the trains, like there's not much there, which is fine. The stock rounds are the real game, but the stock rounds can be extremely massively disrupted by specific things that can happen in those otherwise unimportant operating rounds. Like someone buys the next train that rusts a bunch of trains. Now the whole game state is broken. But well, what- because it's not just the turn order of the, of the, that you have in the stock round. There's a separate turn order of which order the companies will take their turn in the company round. Yep, right? but you can't manipulate the turn order of the stock round during the operating round. But yeah, you, you can, right. So the stock round is determined. Basically, there's an order that's set randomly at the start of the game, and there's a first player marker. And basically, whoever takes the last stock action, buying or sell, and or selling, and then everyone passes, the next person after the person who took the last action. So let's say I buy a stock, everyone else passes, then I pass. Yep. Whoever is to my left is going to now go first. The order is always the same. It's like clockwise yep. around the table. And right? that's the fundamental thing that I feel is holding these games back from being great generally as opposed to being great in this extremely narrow niche. Right. The second thing is so the order that the companies operate is from most valuable to least valuable. Yep. There's this whole so, complicated market. Listen to our 1846 episode. If right. We'll talk so about because that because. Because companies can only buy trains on their turn, they can't at the end of their turn also. They can't sell trains, right? So if you want if you have two companies and you want company A to sort of take trains away from company B and company B to then buy a good train with all of the money that it has now and then get rid of company A, you need to make sure that company A that's gonna do the buying, right, to pull the shitty trains into itself has to be more valuable than company B so that it goes first. Yep, but at the the same time, you also have to make sure that other companies that could buy a train in the wrong order don't exist and operate before you and fuck it up. Right, it's like, I want to buy a four train. Well, there's only a few of those in the game. If too many other players go before you, they'll buy all the four trains before it's your turn. But if too many go after you, you might buy the four train and then other people can execute their plans and move right into the sixes and you get rusted in one of your companies and you're bankrupt. Right, so that turn order just matters so much and you can pay attention to it and manipulate it, which is a skill, right? Uh, But you have very few levers with which right. to manipulate it, and you're you very have, much you, at the mercy of the other players and the physical yes. turn order. Yes, you do have few levers with which to manipulate it, but you can see it so you can at least avoid falling into its trap, 
right? Yep. Um, if you're watching it closely. But the biggest problem is that it's just disappointing. Not to say that that's a bad game. It's just like you come to the train game wanting to do train stuff. And it's like, you're not doing train stuff. You're doing yep. turn order stuff. But then right? you think, oh, well, what I actually want to do, like you realize the fun of this game is the corporate shenanigans and the stock stuff. Like that's real fun. But then you're like, oh, how do I execute the plan? How do I fuck Scott over, loot this company, leave him with the shell, the, the rotting husk? Like, how do I pull that off? You know how to pull it off. But the only way to actually execute it is to manipulate the turn order. Thus, the turn order becomes the primary driver of success or failure. But even worse, the turn order becomes the primary determiner of whether or not you even have the option to do the fun part of the game. So the second thing in this game is that um, it is not as bad as Monopoly. Um, but we talk about this in a lot of our panels. Oh, the games yeah, that are, yeah. The games that are over, but they're not over, right? So a perfectly designed game of any kind, a sport, uh, uh, you know, a children's yep. game, whatever. Pong, Pong right? is actually like the first video game is 100% right. perfect in this regard. Right. Pong, which, and te well, tennis is perfect, which is why Pong is perfect. Oh, yeah. Because right? yeah. they're, the, they're the same. Uh, a game at the start of the game, a perfectly designed game, all participants, teams, or players, right? In an ortho game, by the way, a game with winning and losing, yep, uh, should have a perfectly equal chance of winning. So, Aaron, in a four now, player player skill is a separate factor here. We're talking about in terms of right. the actions that a player the game could state. Take. Yes, we're talking about based on game state alone at the start of a game, right? All if it's a four player game, all of the four players should have a twenty five percent chance to win. If it's a two player game at the start of the game, both players should have a fifty percent chance to win. Right? Yep. Then. As soon as or before, right, one or more of the players reaches a 100% chance to win, the game should end. If someone is at a 100% chance to win and the game has not yet ended, they're still playing the game, which is, for example, what happens in Monopoly. Yep. You've won the game. Your chance of winning is 100%, but other players have not yet gone bankrupt, so the game is not officially over. The game is you're continuing to play a game meaninglessly, garbage time. That is a bad game design. It is also a bad game design if one or more players have an extremely low or 0% chance to win and they are still playing and not eliminated, right? Yep. So I think 1889 of the three we've played suffers from that the most. It's hard to say because 2038, I am incapable of reaching the end of that game. Well, I think part, yeah, I think in 2038, we weren't cap we only played it once and we weren't capable of necessarily feeling the percent chance to win, right? So like if you don't realize, if no one is good enough to realize that they have won or lost already, then the game can actually continue to be fun yeah. as you continue playing. We talked about right? that way back, way back in our review of Railroad Tycoon, how even if you're losing, the manipulation of the game state is fun enough to where people tend to not care that they're losing or even realize well, that, it. Right, well, that's losing should be fun, right? Yeah. Is that the game should be fun even if you are losing and know it. Yep. But I'm saying is that if you don't know you're losing, right, then the game can still be fun if it wouldn't be fun mm -hmm. if you knew you were losing. Exactly. Right? Or if you knew you'd already won, right, the game could potentially still be fun. But like 1846. Right? If you didn't know you already won. I feel like there are more, players have a little more agency in the very end of the game to alter the, the final sorting. But in 1889, like the game ends and then it's just, it's a spreadsheet of, all right, the last operating rounds, 3x revenue, that player wins and we know the game's over. Yeah, so it's like, you know, you might get, I got burnt, I made a mistake early, right? And that's every time I play these games, I've never won ever, ever yep. not even once. Uh, but I keep playing them anyway, because every time I play, I learn, I make some horrible mistake that yep. makes me lose. Uh, and I learn, and I don't make the same mistake again. And I just keep doing it, and I you make, make a less new and mistake, less mistakes. But later. Right. But unlike Go, which is the same exact learning pattern, I hate playing Go, even though I respect Go as a game, is because... In Go, there's too many cycles, right? And there's no heuristic. I don't actually learn. Well, I'll play Go and lose and not know why I lost. Yep. Right? 18xx Whereas games. Whereas if I play 1886 or 1889, I'll, I, I just lost a game that took a couple days. I learned 10 different things I did wrong, and I'll never do any of those things more than once again. Yep, and we're playing this online implementation, I'm, so we can actually step back through the log. Like, I'm looking at the first game we played, the three-player one, just to have it up on the screen. I can just look back through the log and you can pinpoint the exact moment a player made the mistake that loses them the game. 
Right, and notice how those mistakes I made in the first three-player game I did not make in the second one. Yeah, the second right? one, you made a mistake way later. The problem was the mistakes you made in the second game set me up to get completely screwed when up to that point, I had a chance of winning. Right, I think that... Uh, well, I'll get to that later, yeah. right? So, so the point is, is that in this game, right, I had made a mistake and lost relatively early. I knew my percent chance of winning was basically zero once I had made that mistake. It was still fun to continue playing to some extent, but the game, that's a, that's a poor game design. The game should have eliminated me or ended the game, right? Um, and then B, we had reached a point in the game where we knew who won, but the game was not yet over. Yep. We had to do two more sets of whatever, just doing math to, figure, to, to reveal who had won. But the game should have ended because yep. someone had so won. So interestingly, at right? least 1889, one of the rules is if a player actually goes bankrupt, the game it's not that they're eliminated, the game just immediately ends. That is a good rule, that if you do actually go fully bankrupt, the game ends. I feel like that's, let's say, that the, the fiction there is the government comes in and is like, what the fuck just happened in here? Yes, exactly. That is perfect. That actually happened to me the first time I played <laughs> uh, Or the second time? I forget. Second time. Uh, but anyway, the point is, that that's a good rule, but you could get really close to bankrupt without being bankrupt yep. and the game would continue, but you would be suffering and losing the whole time f stuck in this game for no reason. Yep. Um, now, the, I guess the other, the interesting thing about the games is that the stock rounds, as fun as they are, they're extremely constrained in very specific ways to where a lot of the clever things you think you'd be able to do, you really can't because you can sell any number of shares or buy and or buy exactly one share. Right, you can sell a whole bunch and buy one. You can buy one, then sell a whole bunch. Usually you would sell first to get the money to buy with, yep. right? Because it doesn't really matter what the order is, right? But basically, you can buy exactly one share and you can sell as many as you want and you have to. You can't mix them up. You can't like sell, buy, sell. Yep. It's sell, buy, or buy, sell. And then it's the next person's turn and you can only buy one total share. This is why the turn order matters a lot. I can't just come in I mean, I guess the turn item might matter more if you could buy as many as you want. Because, like, I go first. I buy 10 shares. Yep. <laughs> but um, but that, that's where the turn order, the stock round is a little, is not quite granular enough. Coupled with all these other rules that really constrain, like, there's rails on the game. Get it? But the rails yeah. are things like, if once someone's selling stock, because you never tr buy and sell stock between players. You're basically always selling it to the market and buying it back from the market. But there's mm -hmm. all these rules, like... No one player can own more than 60% of any company. No one player, no one can sell stock into the market once there's 50% of the shares of that stock in the market. There's all these sort of guardrails that prevent a lot of potentially interesting things from happening. I know the reality of why those rules are in place is because with these rules as written, the game does not work and breaks without those rules. But I feel mm -hmm. like a better designed stock round could remove a lot of those restrictions and let players go a little more hog wild while still being interesting and while still giving players the agency to pull off those ridiculous maneuvers without giving other players no chance to defend themselves. There's a sweet spot there that no one has found. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's people trying who designed these games trying to stick to some sort of historical accuracy. Oh, there is definitely a little bit of trying... cargo cult design in that a lot of 18xx yes. games do things because other 18xx games a person liked did them oh yeah it's definitely it's it feels a lot like you know there was DD &D and then everyone had their DD &D mod yep. right this 18xx is like well there was the original 18xx game and then everyone published their little mod and actually made them into real games as opposed to just their home brew right so it's like it's like here's a whole world of every single person's D and D homebrew where yep. they change the rules just the way they like, but they have you know they've changed them in ways that do significantly make them different games. Like eighteen forty six games... and eighteen eighty nine, come I engage with them completely differently. I feel completely differently about them while I'm playing. I like them both equally for different reasons. Yep, but they're still at their core the same sort of thing right yep. it's not a bigger divergence right it's like fixing D, &D with by making pathfinder yeah it feels different but it's still the same thing it's a turn-based miniatures combat rpg kind of thing yep right even though you 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 shimmied it over and, and fixed some and things, that's the thing without you didn't, you didn't leave the arena without right? some testing and some futzing around and doing some math it's hard to tell from play which of those guardrail rules are there because someone found a problem and that was their solution versus which ones were basically copy pasted from a different 18xx game. Right. It's very so hard to So what tell. I think is 
what I think is missing from a lot of these games is that uh, a they're clearly political games because they're multiplayer games yep. where you can interact with each like other. Like in the last game we played, right? Chris had a choice of which of the two other players who because the the like we're playing this online implementation. And one cool thing it does is it shows at any time the total worth of any player because in the end your score mm-hmm. is how much money you personally have. Uh, including all Plus the stock here, the you value own. of your stocks. Yeah. yeah. So it shows that at every point during the game, and there was a critical turn where you were already done. You were out of the game. Your worth was like half everyone else's. But the rest of us were basically equal in worth. And on that round, Chris dumped a bunch of the stock in a company that I own the most of instead of someone else, which pulled me way down. That that is a political decision. Uh, I like that about these games. Like, I don't want them to become apolitical. That's a very different kind of game. But the politics is definitely there. Though I think for a lot of players, it's highly obfuscated by the mechanics. I think a lot of players think these games are more deterministic than they are and don't understand. Well, there's no randomness. Yeah. There's no randomness other than the original turn order. Yep. Right? So I think that what I want want politics-wise is I wish there were more enforceable politics just a little bit right yeah. so for example let's say two people uh bought too many private companies in the original auction and they can't float alone right but they could float together right if they wanted to but because of turn order one person the person who goes first would have, buy the first share yep. and then that next person is not man they don't they can't there's nothing to enforce them to say yeah. you're floating the way this with game me works. Made scott, a deal. scott starts to float a company he's like Rim, i can float this if you help me and i'm like yeah sure it comes to my turn i float a different company fuck you right it's just yeah, there's nothing to do about it right i wish there was some i'm sure some of these 18xx have deal making yeah there shouldn't be just free wheelie deal deal making no because like then you're just making a general up like a bad sidereal confluence yeah no 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 i don't want that level of stuff but i do want there should be some sort of you know, there is a solution. Uh, there is a right? very elegant- especially that also helps you with that problem of your chance to win is low. You clearly see another winner. If you could make a for sure alliance, right, uh, of some kind that's somewhat enforceable or a per- has actual in-game effects, there is a that specific could, obvious that solution that I one path to coming back that right? I almost want to try to write down and try to play 1889. I might just play it by myself just to make sure the math all works. There's an elegant mm-hmm. solution to that, but before I reveal my elegant solution, I want to back up to another point you made about the politics. One flaw in these games is that political risk, which what I mean by that is there are actions you can take in this game that are not that do not expose you to political risk, meaning because you bought 10% of a company, no one can just arbitrarily fuck you over because of that. Mm -hmm. But once you buy 20% of a company that someone else owns, depending on turn order, you've opened yourself up to political risk where another player may have, if you have a better turn order, you haven't opened yourself up, but at least not in the next round because, and, but then if the turn order were, because as long as you can make it to the next round, you could just sell the shares and you're safe. But there's almost no operational risk and minimal market risk in this game. The only risk you can actually expose yourself to is political risk which means that generally, if you're tied or slightly behind, the only options you have to get ahead, there's no like risk assessment you can do because all the actions that only incur market risk will not be enough to matter. So you end up having to expose yourself to political risk, but there's no low-level political risk in this game. If you expose yourself to a political risk in this game, either you're fine or you're completely fucked. There's almost no yeah. middle ground you can't, at any point. You can't actually climb in this game. All you can do is push other people down. Yep. See, if you push everyone else down because they exposed themselves and got burned and you're left on top, yep. you've got all this money, you can buy all the shares, you will just naturally rise. All the companies just rise. So I got burned right? once in the late game, which is fine. That's what you expect. So now I was behind a little bit. The two players who were ahead of me were neck and neck, and there was nothing I could do to push down both of them. And due to the way the stocks evolved, I ended up not being able to push down either of them in any meaningful way. Meanwhile, you were basically out of the game. Pushing you down would help me a little, but it wouldn't hurt. It, like hurting you doesn't matter, and helping me it doesn't was help not you to hurt me. Yep, I could help. Doesn't my... help you to hurt me if I've already taken a hurt. Exactly, but simultaneously, right? I'm already out. There was no action we could take together to try to rise up together. 
because it was late game. There were no right. stocks not left with, not, with the, not with the rules as written. Yeah, exactly. Those are the kinds so of I things. So I think the other things is that if you want to, I would either, so because the turn order is so important, um, I think I would either, A, put in more uh, direct turn order mitigation or management mechanics. So for example, you might bid on turn order. You might, uh, everyone starts with the same amount of money, right? But if going first is better, why should the first player start with the same amount of money, right? It's like a basic board game balance thing, right? It's like Puerto Rico. The first three people get in to go, the last two people get corn because going last is worse. Yep. So the corn balances it out, right? It's like just simple stuff like that to, to mitigate that turn order thing a little bit, yep. right? But um, you can't mitigate it too much without making other significant changes to the or, game. Or eliminate turn order and make it more about simultaneous actions. If you eliminate turn order, now the game is oh, actually about that's the what stock I'm on trading. About. I want to workshop and, and try not these about games turn order with the idea right. of a simultaneous market. Like you basically write a limit price on a bunch of orders. You reveal them all simultaneously. Players orders execute against each other, and then anything that doesn't execute against a player executes against the like. There's a system you could come up with, but. One of my worries is that if you s remove that obfuscation and remove the player turn order and made the stock rounds like more of a game, I think what happens is you reveal how little most of the other mechanics matter to the point that they can be completely eliminated and you've made a completely different game. Yeah, I think that's what it is, is that all of the 18xs games I've played, it's that there's these multiple, it's, it's hard to develop heuristics and make decisions. Because the thing you're directly interacting with is is sort of hiding the truth. You know what right? it's like? It's, it's like playing old People always Kalos. talk about how it's a... Right. Well, people talk about it, it's a spreadsheet game, yep. right? But it's like, well, okay, there's a lot of spreadsheet games out there. You know, people always talk about like, e you know, Eve or whatever, Eve Online, right? The way this spreadsheet works is that your... The inputs you have, right? It's like you're taking turns messing with the spreadsheet, first of all. So when you, when you get to mess with it matters a ton because... Yep. Who knows what it's going to look like by the time you get your hands on it. You could only put in inputs on the far left, right? Those inputs directly affect things like on page two of the spreadsheet. So you're looking at page one and page two, right? And you're like, okay, I'll type this on page one. This happens on page two. I type this on page one. This happens. And that's where you're thinking, right? When you're, when you're new to these games. But actually, page two is affecting something on page three and maybe even page four. Mm. And that's what the real game is. And you can't see that because it's not told to you. You have to just like dig deep and be like, oh, buying this share here, right, means that the value, that is the 10th share in this company. It's the end of the stock round. It will bump up. It will bump up. Therefore, it will go first. It is someone else's company. They get to go first. Therefore, that company will be able to put a token on that spot on the train track which means that the company that goes after it is going to, its trains are going to run shittily because that token will be blocking them, right? So it's like, oh, you're, you're thinking when you made that decision, right? Just like, oh, that company, that's a valuable share. It's going to increase in value. Why wouldn't I buy it? Yep. Sound investment, right? But actually you have fucked over this other company quite a bit because of the token situation on the map, right? By buying a share, uh -huh. which is, you can't see that kind of thing happening. Or you can, it's so or even un worse, obvious. You get to the situation where you can see it, but you have no agency to manipulate the turn order to avoid it because of some other player passed and now there's like there's literally no way to get the player to your left to take an action before you pass. There's no way to go first. Right, it's like okay, now that I've seen that this token thing is a possibility, Right. What can I do? It's like you're not there's no move you make that's like the get ahead move. It's the avert disaster. Avert disaster move, right? or fuck someone else and get way ahead. It's basically don't step on landmines. Yep. Right. And then ho try to get other players to step on your landmines that you set. Now don't think if they step it's all you know what this and is. Everyone's everyone's always walking spy. forward. 18xx games are just spy versus spy on the NES. Kind of. That's, yeah. that's what this game you're, is. Everyone's everyone is always marching forward, right? And you sort of snowball as you move forward because the more money you have, the more money you make in the stock market, right? Um, the more shares you own, right? All the shares are moving up mostly. They can move down a little bit, yep. but, but you can't really like lose all your money on a bad investment. Despite the fact that we just spent like 45 minutes kind of like really nitpicking all these fiddly rules and complaining about them, these games are still very fun. Yeah, I think that's the thing that's, uh, that 
makes this such so much discussion about them is that there's this core that is crazy fun, right? Uh, and you you learn something new every time that you can, you know, unlike Go, where you lose and you don't know why you lost. You yep. lose every time and you know why you lost and you keep improving, which gives you this fun cycle of learning every single time, right? Um, you get lots, even if you lose, right? You get this uh, sort of reward, right? You don't yep. feel bad about it. Um, it's fun to play and you, there's a strong desire, which is why every time we talk about these games, I feel like people who play these games... When I see them talk, they talk about the game. Whereas yep. when me and Rim talk, we talk about how to fix the game. Yep. And the re we do that for every game, but we do it especially for these games uh, because there's this sort of disappointment and also sort of uh, mm. excitement of having like, you found a buried treasure, but we need to drag it out of the dungeon. Yeah, because right? like the game's bad. We don't nitpick the mechanics. We look at the mechanics we're like, wow, fuck this game. And we don't there's exactly. no, we don't want to save it. We're happy to let it die. We don't even remember. We're like, the game we're like, oh man, look at this great stuff we found in this 18xx game. How the hell do we get this good stuff out and not and and remove all this mess? Stuff Wait a that's minute. Annoying. So if 18xx games are just uh are just five or spy on the NES, then you and I playing 18xx games is just torchbearer. We're just trying yeah. to get the stock round and the operating round out of the dungeon somehow. Well, there are games out there, the City of the Big Shoulders. Oh, and I yeah, just but learned, they always leave something behind. I learned about this other one recently uh, called, what was it? I forget what it was called. But basically, it's a game where there's still, they have that meta game of stock buying yep. and then operating, right? And I think that's a good that people have recognized that you can take that meta structure mm. where the meta game is the real game around some other game that could be literally anything. Like you could take Carcassonne and be like, all right, instead of you being a color, we're going to buy stocks in the different colors. And then at, after we've done buying stocks, whoever has the most stocks in a color will place the tile and the meeple for that color. Yep. And, and then, then we'll shareholders get again. victory points split among themselves. Right. Exactly. And it's like, you know, you could just play stock Carcassonne like that, right? You could do it to any game. Uh, so that's been recognized and done, but I think there is so much potential in that model that has been uh, unfulfilled. Yep. Right? And it gives me a great games, desire to work on that. For whatever reason, 18xx games have touched the face of God in all these places, but they haven't quite pulled it all together into a coherent experience. It's like they're uh, sitting on the face of God, but they don't know it. Ah. Right? Like they're riding around on a giant turtle, but they don't know they're on a giant turtle. And I think it's partly because right? the games aren't it's like, widely... I see the turtle and I'm like, oh my God, how do I ride on the turtle? But also I've noticed that the community around these games tends to hyper-focus on the games themselves and is relatively small. And I'm not saying they don't recognize flaws in the games and have opinions about them, but there they seems have, to be very... They all have different opinions about which ones they like the best and, you know... But there's very but, little, like, willingness to discuss radical changes to the games. Like, the, it doesn't... I know. They want to play 18xx. They want to play what it is. They don't want to play... They don't want to just take these certain parts that we yep. like, right? We like parts. They like everything that's in there. They're not upset. So, to get back to the thing I said before, and then I think we've talked about this game enough... Uh, the way to fix that binding problem without making it a game where we're just making deals forever, like binding deals, is to add, without changing any other rule in 1889, I think this would work, you add the concept, players, a third option during the stock round. You can buy, you can sell, or you can sell a futures contract to another player. Well, there is one that, there's a New York one that has short selling. Yeah, short sell, well... I have ideas about short selling, but that doesn't solve the problem of you and I want to make a deal to float a company. Right. With a futures contract, the way it would work is I would sell you. Let's say we want to float. I want to float a company. I want to get you to agree to help me float that company. You actually want to, but the game has non-binding rules and we both know whichever one of us moves first, the other one's just going to fuck them over and go with someone else. Right. Because so, that's the best move. Yeah. So I sell you a futures contract. I say for $300... I will sell you a contract where in X turns or in one turn, or like I got to figure out the details on this, you must buy three shares of that company from me or, at this or, set or, price. Or have them. No, buy them from me. Oh, right, right, right. You give right. me cash now. Now I have your cash and my cash. You have a futures contract. You are obligated to buy those shares from me. I am obligated to sell them to you. We have agreed on the price of that transaction and cash was exchanged accordingly. And then 
as I buy, I buy all the stock, I go through the whole float, I float the whole thing, and then I hand those shares over to you for the agreed upon price. Right. Two turns later, here's the shares. Yep. And yeah. I think that would work without changing any other rule in 1889, but I don't know if I am non-lazy enough to try it. Yeah, who knows? Playtesting is the, is the hard part of game making. Yep. And you can only get so far just reading your own rules and playing your game in your mind or playing it against yourself. Yep. That's a good way to design a game that only you are good at. Sure. <laughs> All right. So yeah, 1889. Now we've talked about three of these different train games. If I had to rank them, 1889 is still my favorite, then 1846, and 2038 is, without a digital implementation, unplayable by me. I just haven't played enough of them to have a real opinion on favorite. Yeah. Um, well, I'm I do want to play it. I want to play 18. I do want to. Yeah, I do want to call attention to uh, on the GMT Games website. Um, there is currently it's sort of it's not a, it's not a Kickstarter, uh, but basically they have this program they call the P500 program, oh. where when enough copies of a game are pre-ordered, then they make the game. Um, so there is a game, 1833 NE, which is 1833 New England, uh, railroading in New England. And it is uh, an 18XX game, and it's on a New England map. And there have already been 734 orders of this game. And if you order it now, it'll cost you $58. Ooh. If you wait, it'll cost you $84. So I ordered it already for $58. All right, I'll much, play that. Much, uh, and it's an 18xx game and on a New England map, and I think that it also comes with an 1846 like mini expansion. So if you already have 1846, or if you have a friend uh, who has 1846, then uh, you're good to go. And also, the designer of 1833 New England is Tom Lehman, who has made almost most of the great games that we, you know. So you know, Race for the Galaxy, I think, right? Pretty sure. That's the guy, right? Yeah. Roll for the Galaxy. Pandemic, right? Did he make Pandemic also, maybe? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at the map of 1833 NE right now. Yeah, yeah. I got distracted. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>